welcome, welcome to this edition of God Stories Radio. Real people, real stories. www.godstoriesradio.com This is Session 28. I'm Fritz. I'm Mike. And I'm Trish. I'm really excited tonight, as if I'm never excited every time that we do this, Mikey. We went back down to Miami, and Aubrey got her port taken out. Wow. So for the first time in her life, she is wireless. Wow. She's had a port for since she was like nine? She's had some kind of access to her veins through the course of her life, since nine months of age. Wow. You know, whether it be IVs... um, uh, pick lines. So now she says that she wants to get baptized because she wasn't ever able to get baptized before because she couldn't. She's got sutures. It'll wait till next week. How exciting. Man, I She's am excited. excited. I know. I know. She looks good, doesn't she? Yeah, she mm. does. Wow. We Liver missed real men. I know it. Well, Tripped everybody up. In real men. <laughs> I said, uh, in real men. I got up and thanked everybody, and I said, you know, if things would have worked out perfect, and she would have been here tonight. And I said, which she is. And then I called her up, and the place just went ape. Yeah, but then you also said something up there, too. You said, I'm lost for words. Well, that was a lie. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> That'd be a first. You're saying I'm a loss for words? <laughs> Speaking of words, can I talk about your husband for a minute? Sure. Uh, our guest is uh, Liz Lessing tonight, and her husband, Dave, I've, I've got to say, I love this guy because uh, he's really been a good friend, but he was uh, instrumental in talking me off the ledge a few times down there in Miami. And uh, one particular time, I was really struggling in between the surgeries and seeing Aubrey and that really just, you know, when she's hooked up to all those machines and, you know, it does something to your psyche. And, man, I cried for two solid days. I usually, I prayed my normal prayer, you know, Lord, throw me a bone. The phone rings. It was Dave. The form of Dave. And Dave had a similar testimony where he witnessed his mother in between, you know, I guess, our, with surgery like that and everything. And, I mean, it was just the, the spitting image of what I had been through. And he was able to encourage me. And that's just how God works. Yeah. And I thanked him a hundred times for just being faithful. And he said, you know, uh, uh, they had played uh, that night, I think both of you did, the mm-hmm. praise and worship that night. And he said, all through the praise and worship, you were on my mind. He said it was really hard to concentrate on his guitar parts because um, he had thought about us. And I said, that's the way God works, man. And I tell you, he talked me off the ledge that night. I was just boohooing and... So I'm going to let you introduce our guest, Mikey. All right. Well, the reason why I'm introducing uh, Liz is because when God uh, gave me this, uh, what do you want to say, uh, uh, calling, so to speak, and, and God Stories Radio about Christian testimonies and putting it on the air and all, and when this all came about, I had just not too long before had seen uh, Liz's uh, real life, change life video. And um, I was in tears. And when this came about, she was one of the first ones I thought of for this. And here she is now on Session 28. Yeah, it's amazing. I saw, well, after I saw that video, I think I saw you out at the coffee table. <laughs> I said, that was just amazing. And I had just started going to real life, I think, at really, that point. It had to be that far long ago, yes. Yeah, because uh, Ezra was just tiny. Yeah. I want to thank you, too, because we we ask people often to do testimonies and not everybody says yes hmm. so thank why. you for for doing that yeah. mm-hmm. i guess we're gonna let you have the mic and take it away okay i like to start with thinking about how my life was 10 years ago but just because it's so completely different it blows even my mind today when i really stop and think about it um but 10 years ago i was living in dc Um, in the heart of Washington, D.C., an area called DuPont Circle. And I had a great job. I'm familiar. (laughs) 
It was a really cool area. I had a great condo. I could, you know, take the the train to to work or I could walk to work. I had a great job as a government contractor. And I managed these um, large training projects for the Department of Homeland Security. In fact, it was during that time when... The Department of Home. It was nine one one. I was I was there for nine one one, and I, it was formerly the INS that I was working for, which then became Department nice. of Homeland Security. Yeah. While I was working there, and I I also had you know a, a top level clearance, which is kind of interesting now, but we'll get there. So I was able to buy. You know, I got I I made great money, and I was you know able to buy you know expensive things that I thought were so important. Um, at that time, I was dating this really handsome CEO and owner of um, a web design firm who he drove a Jag and and he played basketball with George Clooney and, you know, he was all that. Or so I thought. The picture of my life was like an ad, like an advertisement for like Crate and Barrel or something, right? <laughs> but, the, but the woman that... that was behind that life was really falling apart because I was unfulfilled, I was lonely, I was insecure, and I was sad. But I wanted you to think that um, I had it all together and I tried hard to, to prove to everyone just how happy I was. After all, I really felt like these things defined me. All of, um, you know, the boyfriend, the, the, the material things, the, the job, and that was, that was my definition but what really filled me were secrets and lies and my life was just um it was it was just an act and I basically couldn't keep it all together um but let me talk about I wanted to I was thinking about this tonight before I came here that there are a few things that that truly defined me at that point in my life um even as a you know when I think being a teenager uh, um into my 20s. I was an atheist, number one. I was a bohemian. I was, you know, ultra cool and artsy and kind of had that like existentialist view on life that it didn't really matter. And there was there was no God and people that believed in all of that Jesus stuff were really weak and just needed um, a crutch. I also, in my head, I was famous. You know, I, I like had this like I I went to school for um, for acting for eight years. I went to an arts high school in Baltimore, <laughs> in the Baltimore School for the Arts, and um, I also went to college, um, an arts conservatory college for acting. And so, you know, I had this like in my mind where I was, you know, kind of in in my head, I was like famous. I was like living this lifestyle of I, I wasn't famous, but you know. I was going to say, yeah, legend in your mind, into yourself. Right, exactly. And I was also I was judging. You know, I was very judgmental of, of people that weren't like me, who didn't think like me, um, who didn't think outside the box, who didn't want to take risks, and who didn't want to drink, who didn't want to party, who didn't want to have an altered state of, of mind. Um, I, er, I learned really er, young when I was a teenager, a late teenager, that um, how to cope with life was through altered states. You know, I was always, you know, drinking and then doing drugs. And I couldn't imagine why anybody wouldn't want to do that. You know, it didn't make sense. Like, why? It made me uncomfortable, in fact, to be around people who who never part, partook in that. Like, if we had people over and someone was like, no, 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 I don't drink, I'd be like, what's wrong with them? You know, I just, I really, it kind of made me uncomfortable so at that point in my life when I was in DC and I was you know living this big lie you know I, eventually it came to a point where I just couldn't handle it anymore and I and even though I was trying at that point in my life to be sober I you know was was slowly relapsing and drinking and I was be- becoming this big mess and so as I was you know 
messing everything up in my life, I decided I had to leave, which I was very good at. I was very good at starting over. You know, I, I love to move to a different city and start all over because that was my fix. That's the whole actress feeling. Right. <laughs> the geographical cure. Exactly. So I was going to go to, you know, another big city that was just, and I was going to be great and famous there, right? Um, certainly, God never entered into the picture, right? So, um, you know, I, I had moved to... I, New York. I lived in Chicago for a long time, and of course D.C. And so I was contemplating where where was I going to go? Um, but you know, none of those moves ever worked out. Of course, they always I always wound up in the same place. Um, it wasn't a remedy to my soul sickness, as I like to say. Um, but really. Like moving to other places would just I I would wind up becoming even more destructive, and um, even and I still wanted to always believe that lie that you know the alcohol and drugs were gonna uh, were gonna cure me someday someday of something I I don't know what I was trying to find while I was digging holes and holes into my into my soul, but you know I grew up as a Christian in a Christian family I should say. Um, my parents were Presbyterian, and um, you know we grew up in a small town in Maryland and went to church every weekend. But I have to honestly say that I didn't understand anything about the Bible. I mean, I never nothing was ever shared with me in a real way, so I never connected to it. And to me, it was like, a, it became like mythology. Like, this is just something that people believe because it's not really real. That's how disconnected I was. So in my mind, it, it was like a Greek mythology. Like, wow, people believe this stuff, just like the Greeks believed in their gods. Right. And then, mm -hmm. but people today, modern people are believing in this, but it's really just mythology. So that's kind of how that progressed for me. But my parents were very Christian and very... Um, you know, never done anything wrong. I mean, they were, I really kind of saw them as, as perfect. They didn't, they didn't drink. They didn't, it's not like I grew up in a home where it was, it was tragic and there weren't bad things happening. I mean, they were responsible adults. They never drank. That was never part of their lifestyle. Um, they didn't even swear even, you know, and it was just very, it was very conservative. And so I think when I found the arts and I got, I was went in that direction, I was, I found this whole world of like being super liberal and open and wow. And like, I was so different from my family and I was rebellious and I wanted to you know, do everything they told me not to, <laughs> and 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 lie about it. That's the thing. I was so such a sneak, and and I, I sometimes think of it as like God's truth had been turned into a lie, and I worshipped my own wisdom. It was like worshiping my own wisdom because I was I I thought I was so cool. You know, really at that age, you know, I was so cool. Okay, so. After D.C., I moved to Arizona. And and the odd thing is, when I was first trying to get sober back in D.C., I had always thought that the desert was going to be where I got sober. And I, I didn't think about this at the time, but I was drawn to Arizona, and I was drawn there because I originally I was going to a rehab. So I left D.C. I left that whole life, everything in it. I left it there. I went to Arizona. And um, I was going to start all over. Now, Arizona is is a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, of course, the West is I, – I had never lived in the West before. And it's mm -hmm. just – I mean, it's it's so incredibly beautiful. You know, it's not like the East Coast. You know, it's so different. It's just open landscapes and open sky. And the colors are intense and rich. And it's just absolutely beautiful. And I, I loved it there. Of course, I was getting sober, and I had a lot of, of help and connections there. And I got set up there. Um, but then, of course, I was still the same. I, you know, I still didn't have God and still not entered the picture. And I wound up relapsing. But this time was a little different because it was, you know, a little bit more intense. There were um, casinos there. And I met I met people that like weren't so 
good, not such a good influence on me. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I found a new love. I love to gamble, and um, I started doing meth, um, which I had never done before. Felt like that was meth was was my new cure to my alcoholism because mm-hmm. I didn't really want to drink when I was doing meth. It was just all all fine, and I really thought, oh, wow, this is you great. You switched addiction. I've all uh, right. I've like, cured myself. It's funny because she's not the first testimony that's I actually said that. that. Really? They, they came from drinking, and yeah, then they got introduced was to meth to drinking, Isaac and that was going to be opposite. their cure for yeah. alcohol. I think Isaac. Yeah. Had said uh, that. Isaac said that, and then there was a couple ladies that were that were on here as well that gave their testimony yeah. that said, hey, that's that's not the first time we've heard it, which is really neat. Right. And the gambling, I never really gambled ever. Um, I, I didn't realize that the way you become addicted to gambling is from actually winning. And it's not from it's not from losing. Like, I always thought losing was how you became an addict, but it's actually from winning. Like, I, 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 the first week of gambling, I won, you know, no, thousands of dollars. Addicted. And so, <laughs> right. <laughs> And so I was like thinking, this is great. And so then you spend the rest of the time trying to gain that back because you lose it all, you know, over time you lose it. And then you like want that high again of that win. And so that's what you're trying for. And then you dig yourself deeper and deeper and deeper. But I, you know, I, I started hanging around a guy that um, was, was so addicted to gambling. He, he would spend every, he'd go out to his car and find any change he could in the parking lot to play a slot, whether it was a nickel or a quarter. We would run out of gas because... That's probably not hard to find there, I right, imagine. Right, right, The people. The people that are addicted. And so mm-hmm. I lost uh, everything between the drugs um, and the money, the casino and the, and the money and my sobriety and the, you know, the recovered life that I was, that I was trying to lead. I was digging myself into debt and I kept telling my family lies about what was going on. And, you know, it was just, again, all of these secrets and lies and just trying to remember, um, you know, who I told this and that. And because, I mean, I wasn't, I was down and out. I mean, it was, I was not working. I couldn't hold a job. I'd been fired. And because I would never sleep, you know, I wasn't sleeping for days. Um, so I wouldn't wake up for the job. And, and then I get into a depression, and you know it was just it was cycle just a bad, bad, bad cycle. Well, the guy that I had been hanging around, um, he became really mm, kind of crazy. Like he was, you know, he he had been doing meth a lot longer than I had, and and um, he would get angry. He he started not trusting me because because more than anything he was a um a, a gambling addict and so if there was anything about money it was like he thought i was he had lying that paranoia, right that like paranoia it, right. that comes with that meth addiction yes i know exactly what you're talking yes. about yes yes yeah, i've heard the mood swings are pretty outrageous with that mm-hmm. yes with that drug. right he would just become a different person and what happened was i i found out that uh, I, w- I was pregnant and when I told him, his initial reaction was, was kind, you know, okay, what are we going to do about this? And I remember we were sitting in my apartment, which didn't have any electricity because we couldn't pay the electricity bill. And, you know, it was cold. It was uh, like January. And, you know, he was kind. The next day, it was a lie. Then he was, you know, thinking that I was making this up because... And then it was, you know, of course... I think I always wanted to be a mother in the back of my mind, mm. but I was in no shape to be a mom. So I certainly was not going to keep the child. I was going to have an abortion. That was absolutely what I was going to do because I didn't want to stop doing drugs. Again, that's like how selfish it is, you know. But he thought that I was um, making it up for the money like oh you want money for an abortion right i mean this right. crazy craziness well as it turned out he wound up getting arrested and he, he i never saw him he disappeared and i looked him up he'd gotten arrested for possession of some sort so i was hanging around um a girl that i had actually met in the rehab you know who was really in, into heroin and all this stuff and i was hanging around her and i my car got repossessed so like i didn't have a way to get around and she was going to help me 
you know, manage this thing with the with the abortion. But at the same time, she's dealing heroin, and she's an absolute mess. And so I'm trying to help her, right, keep the finances of the thing because she never knew where the money was. She never knew where anything was, and, like, she was losing it, and it was a mess. It was a disaster to be around. And I wasn't, you know, at, at first I wasn't so into the heroin, but then I was like, oh, I, you know, this is okay. Like, it, if I more... I, if I morning sickness, you know, it's like kind of helped. I know that sounds really terrible, but um, so anyway, we would, uh, I would, I was keeping these journals of the money so that she wouldn't lose it, so we could track it. Um, and I also like to use a green pen, which is kind of interesting as we go along. But so anyway, I'm with her one day, and she's ta- I, I had made an appointment to get an abortion, and I had to go to Phoenix, which was about an hour away from where I lived in Prescott, Arizona. We made, I had made an appointment, and my appointment was the next day. And on this particular day, we had to go back to my apartment, and she was driving me back to my apartment so that I could get some things to take back to her place, and then we were going to leave in the morning. So on our way over there um, to the apartment, we get pulled over because she was, I don't know, I don't even know what she was doing, like swerving or something. And so right before we had left the apartment, um, her place, rather, uh, you know, we had, she was going to stop along the way and, and, you know, make all these pit stops to, we had packaged up all these little um, packages of heroin and weighed them all out. And I wrote with the green pen on the packages and her little green pen, my little green pen. Right. And so, you know, all of these were ready to go. And she even had syringes in her pocket, like ready to go, like, like filled and ready to go. And we'd also just you know and done it ourselves and yeah yeah, and so here we are oh and then I'd also gotten all these like like clean needles I was like so proud of myself so I had those with me too and uh, anyway we get pulled over and it wasn't so good um no no, Mm. to say the least and they found everything and of course I at that time you know I've I felt like, well, it wasn't really my they, stuff. They, they caught a rolling store. Exactly. <laughs> they did. They did. They were. They were floored because they, did, they hadn't really seen a whole lot of hair when I don't. Of course, I, was, I kept falling asleep, and they were, they, they were like, I said, oh, it's just because I'm, you know. Did you I'm, tell them you were pregnant? Yes. Oh. And I said, oh, I'm just pregnant. I'm so tired all the time. I was. Well, I told them I wasn't. You know, of course, they were going to believe me, right? <laughs> well, they. <laughs> so, it's not mine. Right. <laughs> So they took us, you know, and, and, and they had, they held us, they rested us and, and locked us up and went through, of course, the vehicle and all of the stuff in it and all of the things that were mine and hers. And, um, but I still had, in, I still felt like I was, you know, I didn't really have anything to do with it. Like, in my mind, I wasn't the one, it wasn't my idea to deal. You know, I wasn't really doing it. It wasn't my operation. You were but a guess, heroin addict. Right, exactly. That was not my thing. And I've never been in trouble before. You know, she'd been in trouble before. I, you know, I'm not, this is no, I'm going to get out of this one. Like, I didn't think it was going to be the way it was. But remember my green pen? See, mm-hmm. all of my possessions had all that, that little documentation the little green pen. right all the green pen <laughs> no, no. right the green pen was on the packages it was in my so writing the cops are like evidence. right right exactly Who's that was pen? evidence right and it was in my handwriting it was in my purse the book with all of the with all the, the, the ledger right the right the money and i was thinking i was helping her right <gasps> so as it turns out i wasn't leaving there anytime soon in lockup and i mean it was absolutely dreadful because once i once i sobered up um, and realized where what was happening to me, and that I was where I was on, you know, a cement floor in an overcrowded jail that I hadn't. So the, I went Here. to the nurse, in fact, the the jail nurse, and I said, "Listen, I'm pregnant. Of course, they have to test you because I guess they don't believe everyone, and you get extra s- go food. figure. They right. lie, right? <laughs> you, you get extra food like if you're pregnant. So like, <laughs> you do. You get extra snack. And so anyway, so I had to get tested. And I was like, "Listen, I told the nurse. I said, I I I need to get an abortion while I'm in here because it might be too late." Mm-hmm. You know, and she looked at me like I was crazy. Like you are, you are locked up. You don't, you don't have a right to have an abortion in here. What it, you know? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what I am I going to totally do? See me. Where are my rights? <laughs> right. What am I going to do? And uh, you know, being locked up is losing your freedom. You have no idea until it happens. Like you just don't. Like you can't even. 
get a drink when you want to have a when you're thirsty <laughs> you know it's just little thing i mean there's so many things about it that's just awful and miserable not to mention the fact that i couldn't even get in touch with anybody because at that point in time you couldn't call you weren't allowed to call anybody that had a to a, that had a cell phone so you couldn't call out to a cell phone so anybody i knew had a cell phone oh, and i didn't know my parents phone number to even tell them where they were and i knew they were probably wondering what was happening i wasn't you know because i wasn't returning any calls and i really was i was so depressed that i wanted to kill myself and i i couldn't figure out how i was going to do it in there because there's not really anything to do but i was like i'm such i'm so miserable and i'm such a loser and I can't believe my life has come to this. And I'm pregnant. And, you know, here I was thinking that I was going to really make something in my life when I came out here. And it was just it was just awful. And what, what I noticed is that there were some people in, in lockup there that would be laughing. And, like, you know, throughout the day, girls, you know, they'd be walking the walk to try to get exercise. You know, you had, there's a little loop you do. And, and they'd be talking and laughing. And... I just didn't understand how could how they be happy, could they be happy? Like and so I went up to one of the girls who was always happy and I said how can you be happy in here and she looked at me and she said because I have Jesus and I and I was like oh my gosh she's crazy that was my initial <laughs> thought <laughs> really and she said and she got out her Bible she had a Bible there and she was like like I read in here I, every day and and you know it makes me happy and I love Jesus you know and she opened it up she's like I can read with you if you want and and I was like oh well I don't know she said well why don't here why don't you take this you know over to your cell you hang on to it you know she gave me the bible she said if you want to look look at it you get know today to and it. get back to me right get back to me on it kind of thing and so I left and I was like oh gosh um I didn't know what to think of it really and I thought I I guess it's come to this, I thought. And I'm going to, even though, like, even to say the name Jesus at that point in my life was like, I would cringe, kind of. Mm -hmm. I was so incredibly desperate that I thought, well, I, I'm going to try this. And I remember, you know, I laid down and I, and I was just so awful. And I said, Jesus, if if you're real, will you just come hold me that was my prayer and I remember and this peace just came over me and I know this sounds crazy because it sounds like you know how could that how could that be but it was like he really was there and um we know that prayer well Liz oh yeah and you're in good company yeah mm -hmm. right you know the next day I was it was like it wasn't like I was happy to be there, but it was manageable. Bearable. Like I was okay. Mm -hmm. I was okay from that point on. And I got interested in and I thought, well, maybe there's some more to this than I really wanted to admit. Um, so I began talking to those girls and um you know, they shared some some stuff with me and as it turns out, you know, my parents agreed to bail me out. They finally figured it all out and found out and, and all this stuff because they were in Florida at the time and um, they drove out to Arizona and they, they got rid of all my stuff. Thank you. They got rid of all my stuff um, and then they bailed me out only under the guise that I would come to Florida and live in a home, a Christian home that was in Titusville and stay there. Because it's kind of a it's a home where you it's a recovering home where you can also have children, which is kind of hard to find. So, I had decided while I was in jail, of course, that I was going to have the baby. So I got out of jail. I came to Florida, and I was so sad. I was still so sad. I mean, even though you know I was starting this relationship with Jesus, I was so incredibly sad. I didn't want to go come to Florida. I'd never, I, you know, at that point in time, like I thought. Oh, Florida is just a nightmare. <laughs> and I was, I was so, you know, Arizona was my dream and just how beautiful it was. And I was so mad at myself for messing everything up. And here I was, this unwed mother to be. And, uh, you know, I had to live in this home and there were all these rules and I couldn't go anywhere on my own and I couldn't do this or that. You know, I had to stay in the, in the home and 
and I, and, but I didn't have any money. And I didn't have any money to do anything else. That was my cho- my only choice. And so I lived there, and I had my baby in Titusville. And this whole time, I'm learning more about God, and God's working on me. And I'm I'm praying, and I'm praying that He'll change, you know, just my situation. And I had to be patient. Um, but once I had the baby, three months after the baby, you know, I'm still living in the home, which is just really not all that great. <laughs> I mean, they were so kind. Don't get me wrong; these people had devoted their life, their life, to ministering to you know people as, such as myself. But it wasn't where I really wanted to be. It's those gosh darn rules. I know, right? <laughs> the rules, right? And I still had these, you know, I still in my mind was still so new to me that I would just dream about running back to my old life you know I still had that desire to to escape with with drugs it was going to be different this time right right? it was going to be different like but what kept me and God knew this which is why he put me in all those um situations that he did all of the 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 barriers and locks that he put on my life because really if I had run I was all trapped up in the courts and system and you know i come to think that the first one right was you were in jail now you couldn't have the abortion so now you I have know. your son right i know mm-hmm. i know it's a it's like a miracle and little did i know that my son was going to change my life completely i mean the the act of of having that has been the constant that has helped me to stay focused and to have that real desire to want to be transformed by Jesus. I did move after my son was like three months old. My parents had seen a change in me and they asked me to come live with them and they live in Leesburg. And so I moved to Leesburg and I lived with them. I became a convicted felon, by the way. I was convicted on the possession or not possession. It wasn't possession. I wish it was sale of narcotics narcotics possession with the intent to distribute yes so i got involved i had to get that same charge that she got the same charge even though really i felt like it was her that was doing it with your green pen right (laughs) right so anyway i had this convicted felon thing and my dad had said well let's see if you can get a job of course he didn't think i was going to be able to get a job and i did try to get a job at Walgreens and the man hired me I even told him my story and then three days later he said oh I can't hire you because I ran it through corporate and corporate, oh yeah. it's not too so cool <laughs> but um anyway I did you know I, I found little jobs here and there and I um I got work at small you know in small businesses and people through the church I started to go to the church that my parents went to and I decided immediately that um you know, I wanted to. I wanted to immerse myself. You know, I wanted to get involved in this, and I also wanted to live on my own because there's a part of me that didn't want to live with my parents. And you know, I I did wind up getting my own place and getting drunk one night and getting arrested for a DUI. Go figure. So this was like shortly after I had moved back in with my parents that I, you know and got my own place and. It happened really quickly. My son was six months old. I was in jail. Of course, here I am. I'm trapped up now in this Lake County system. And um, I... I, Still on probation. Right. I was still on probation. And then they they thought I was a fugitive. Yeah. So I was in, like, the the high maximum security thing. And I'm like, I'm not a fugitive. It's really legal that I'm here. And so I was very concerned and worried that they were going to send me back to Arizona because there's, you know, an interstate compact and law, legal stuff. and Mm -hmm. Not the way you want to go Right. So if I had gone back to Arizona that way, then it might be years or two. I wouldn't Mm -hmm. see my son. And I just thought, wow, I can't believe this. And it was at that time that I said to myself, God, this is it. There is no other way. I need to totally, I cannot have this thinking anymore. I have to surrender it all to you and amazingly enough i was i got out and you know i was in there about 30 days and i got out um and all of it kind of there was like a technicality with that arrest that allowed me to not totally get off but it wasn't it wasn't going to be what it could have been Mm -hmm. where it would have just like isaac right 
I went right to the church when I got out, and I said I got to be baptized right away. So on May twenty first, two thousand six, I was baptized, and it was at I. It was just a complete and utter transformation. Ever since then, I immersed myself with God's people, and I begged Him to change me. And I. It was the, that fierce commitment to God that allowed Him to completely transform me. I mean. My mind and the way I think now is completely different from the way I used to think. And it, it's and it's only God because it's not anything that I could have ever done. People that knew me back then would never, ever think that I'm the person that I am today, that I am a Jesus follower and a Jesus freak, and I love <laughs> Jesus, and I've committed my life to him. And the, and the drugs and alcohol totally don't even th- enter into my thinking anymore. You know, I had done AA and all that stuff, and AA is a wonderful program, and it can really work for people, but it didn't ever really work for me. God worked for me. Mm -hmm. God took away that desire. I don't think about it at all. I mean, it's so huge for me because for so many years I relapsed, and, you know, I was trying to stay sober and all this. You know, it was the people that I surrounded myself with, too, that helped me, that helped me just live the life. I got to see what it was like to live around Christians. I had this image in my mind of what going to church was from when I was little. It was stuffy. It was fake. It didn't make any sense. It didn't apply. It wasn't applicable to life. That's how I thought of it. I thought church was a place where people that were already perfect went, (laughs) not people that were really messed up. Because I I don't know why. I didn't see that when I was a kid, I guess. When I started to realize that there's, you know, real people that go to, that really Jesus came to, came to earth to, to transform the, the brokenhearted and the people that were at their end, you know, people that were not already perfect. They don't, they don't need Jesus. (laughs) They wouldn't have been as receptive as to someone who is completely broken. Mm -hmm. And I began to realize, wow, yeah, you're right. This is. It's the broken people that that thirst for Jesus, you know, and um, and I began to realize that everyone has a story, and I found um, you know real life Christian church, and I just they've just completely fit me because they were real. I know that's like sounds cliche, but it's true. It I is mean, true. Mm-hmm. It is. I mean, even the even the pastor is not um, better than. And everyone else, you know, Any, he talks about else. his faults. Right. I mean, I like that we he wears all jeans, right? On and he's real, and people, and they want to help people that don't know Jesus. They want, they want to, they encourage you. Don't have to be a certain way to come into church. You can come just as you are, and it's okay if you don't want to like God while you're there. You don't have to, you know, submit and surrender right then and there. You can just hang around. You can see how it works. Mm-hmm. And how it works in people's lives. He yes. had a similar yeah. perception to to you, uh, and he said, you know, be, becoming a Christian back in the day, you know, going from ACDC to the Gaithers was a death sentence. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know? Right. And then, you know, the, the thinking of music, music was, that was one of the things that was, uh, had always been a trigger for me in the past. And, you know, I can listen to Led Zeppelin, and if I mm-hmm. listen to some of that, I'm like, oh, like it gives me this like, oh, I just want to like party you know you have these it conjures up all kinds of images in my mind of things i've done in my past and fun times and the music church music was always awful to me (laughs) like it was just so boring and you know christian music has come so far and it's so different than the way it was of course when i was young that it's like Mm -hmm. you know there's it's good and you know it's passionate and it's um it's everything that can be in other, the, the, the old kind of music, but it's all singing about God. And now I have this totally different view where why would I want to sing about anything else? You know, why would I want to go there when the music can just capture me just as much, you know? Um, You're an amazing musician. When did, you, when did you pick up the keyboards? Right. So I didn't play keyboards, in fact, because, you know, my background was really in, in acting and um, singing. But when I was lived at the Christian home... There was, I had taken piano when I was young, and one of the guys there had this brand new motif um, keyboard, Ooh. and he and he had a, was putting together a worship band. He wanted me to play. I'm like, I don't know how to play. I can't do it. And it'd be time for rehearsal, and I'd hide in the house, <laughs> and he'd come find me. He'd be like, Where are you? I know you're up here. You're coming. I don't care if you're good. It doesn't matter, you know. And he really encouraged me. His name was Will, 
and um he encouraged me to to play and that was when really when i started playing keyboards and i got really into it of course and so I, you learned on a synth that's why mm-hmm. uh, yeah right because i'm not really a, a, a piano player i'm yeah, not but a you're classic an amazing piano. synth player right I mean, and that's what i love about it is i love the i love the sounds uh, and the intricacies too. of the sounds Ooh, and putting yeah. patches together and i can spend hours and hours and hours mm-hmm. And so that's like something, you know, a new, a whole new outlet that I never would have experienced had I been in my old life. Because you know what I'd be doing? I'd be not paying attention to my son. I'd be drinking. I'd be partying and just not doing anything that's constructive. Because I do play worship and I love it. And it's mm-hmm. a way for me to connect to God in a way that I know how um, I, can, I can do that. So I think of myself now, like what defines me, like I started by saying what used to define me, how I saw myself and how I see myself now. You know, I see myself, the first thing I would say about myself is I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus. And am I perfect? No. <laughs> is my life gotten easier since I've been a Christian? Not necessarily. I still struggle. I still have the same, I can still have the same, you know, kind of things that... Um, I struggle with, but that's okay because I can try to, you know, I can pray to God. I can talk to people. I can confess my sins to others, and they can help me and hold me accountable, and I can them, and we're all working together. We might fall down, but we get back up again. Mm-hmm. That's a big thing that I that I used to do. I fell down, and I didn't want to get back up. I was too ashamed. I had all this shame and guilt mm-hmm. about my life. Something that you said, too, um, early on in your testimony no matter how many places you went, you always ended up back in the same place, kind of on that hamster wheel of life, no exactly. matter how fast mm-hmm. you went. And I think God used that to right. transform you. Absolutely. That's for sure. He, you know, he, God has, intru- has done wonderful things in my life since uh, since then over the past, you know, several years. I, I found my husband and I got married. Um I have this awesome son. He's eight now, and he's just incredible. And he's he he's changed my my life. Um, he's never had to see me, you know, in the way I used to be. He's never ever seen me. He doesn't know me as that. I'm, you know, he's being raised in a way. I'm trying to raise him in a way that's that's makes God real so that he wants to do the right thing and make the right choices because God's watching not because he wants to please mommy you know not because he wants to make me happy you know cuz i used to just you know, i didn't want to make my dad mad and that was like in the back of my mind i don't want to make him mad and um but i would do whatever i wanted you know i never had that like like god's watching cuz i'd abandoned that a long time ago i don't know if that makes sense but so anyway, what defines me is that, and I define myself as being a mother and a coach. I like to think of myself as like a coach with my son, Ezra. Um, and I'm so hardworking. I love to I love to work. I love to do stuff. You know, I just, I don't know why. Like, I like to, you know, work hard, whatever. I, there's a few things that I'm really, really into, like the synth, like playing and constructing sounds and putting patches together. And I also... Um, like we have a new business and I love business. I love the, the business of business. I always have. Do and you have I'll... a green pen? <laughs> no. <laughs> I never use a green pen. Ever. Green pen is not her pen. <laughs> I have an orange pen, but I will never use a green pen again. You ever want to just throw one in the trash ceremonially? <laughs> right. Know? Like that you green know. pen. Bye. I mean, can you believe that? Oh. So go ahead, plug it. So the business. business, right. So my husband and, and I Dave, started right? a new business in the fall, and it's a pest control business called Venom Pest Control. Find them on Facebook. And, um, yes, it's it's been a great opportunity for us. And what's interesting is that I have trouble because I am a convicted felon. It doesn't matter how many letters people could write about me and say what a, you know how I've changed my life. None of that matters because on paper I'm a convicted felon. So... Um, that really 
limits the kinds of jobs I can have. So the jobs I used to be able to get that were career jobs that were really good, I can't get those anymore. But you the, know, your identity was so wrapped up in that. I God know. was like, uh-uh. Right. Not and it, let and me it, go there. And it doesn't matter. So David, my husband and I have always like, how can we do a business together so we don't have to worry about that? And you know, he was in the banking industry, which is just ever since the real estate fall, he did, um, he was a loan officer. And all, ever since all of that happened, it's just been a struggle because that industry has completely changed Mm -hmm. that's a testimony in itself because he's in our in our real men group Mm -hmm. and he used to come and share early on and man he would just break out into a sweat when he started Mm -hmm. thinking about what he was going to do and he had so many weeks to find a job but he was getting paid to look for a job Mm -hmm. and this and that he didn't know what he was going to do and then Boom! There it is. Venom. Right, Outside and Utah. right, and he has, and he has family. Um, he has a, he comes from a very big family, and he has family actually in different states that do that have done pest control for a long time, and they were like, "Why don't you start one, and we'll help you and train you, and you know, get you get you set up because you'll you know you'll never look back and say you wish you hadn't done it because you you know you it's it'll work it'll work." And so we just had faith, you know, we pray and. And um, they're God-loving people too, and so you know somehow we're managing it through, you know. And it's and it's good. It's 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 good for David and I. We get to work together and um, sweat it out. Of course, my son thinks that it's um, that business. The business. <laughs> it takes up too much time. The business because it's hard to not talk about the business, like over dinner, and like we're always talking about the business. Oh, the business again, you know. So it's that's kind of funny. It's cute, and we're I like was teasing Dave the other night about coming out with his own guitar line, like Venom guitars <laughs> think, yeah, right? and stuff like that. That would be we awesome. We were having just the best laugh. I said, "Could you imagine the Venom, <laughs> Venom one, Venom two, right. you know, <laughs> special design guitars and?" Mm-hmm. Just, yeah, just dreaming, having fun. Mm-hmm. It's good to see him, though, just bopping around and can see where God's really yep. just reached out and touched him. Blessing you know, him. Yeah, Blessing him both. Absolutely, on both of you. I know, because, you know, he didn't like sitting behind a desk anyway. And mm-hmm. when he was a loan officer, he was out. Like back when, you know, before computers, and you, you, I mean, you can get a loan online now. But, you know, he would go to people's homes. He was interacting with people all the time, and he's he loves that. So this is a great fit for him, too, because he Absolutely. gets to interact with people all the time, right. all day long, and he's moving, he's up, and he's active, and he's, Going you know. Going from place to place. All right, and he loves that. And I love business. I love all the, the stuff about business. I like keeping the books. I do. I like, keeping keeping books. I like keeping the books. I like keeping it organized. I like to make sure we get everything done, and we do everything on time, and we do it right, and we do it efficiently. I'm all about efficiency and, and you know. You know what's the what's the 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 best workflow for that that's going to be that's going to be good for us? The standard operating I know, procedures. Right, right, exactly. Do you have staff meetings and metrics and stuff? <laughs> like that? Right, like we do try to hold you know budgeting meetings every every week. Just just David and I, of course, that's not part of the the budgeting is not really his strong suit. You know, so you know, so it's like, a, like, kind of like, okay, all right, honey, yep, okay. <laughs> well, I'm like, okay, we're gonna stick Whatever, to this, hon, and we're just, only gonna uh, spend this this week, and this and that, and mm-hmm. it's just funny. But, um, but yeah, so it's that's been a real blessing. So God has just really transformed me, and I sometimes, I sometimes think like, if those people, people from my old life could see me now they just wouldn't even believe that it was me they wouldn't believe that i'd be talking about jesus that i'd be up on stage in a in a you know christian church four thousand member christian right, church playing and worshiping god and have you ever seen the girl again that gave you the bible in the jail no never because uh, that was out in arizona of course yeah. and i've never been seen an angel. her you never know <laughs> i know a right? plant yep yep I know. It's a God plant. You know it. Right. It's amazing. So God had to really take away everything from me. All those little details. Yeah, he did. He took away everything. But again, to start for you to look for him, also to save you from having the abortion, all in the same place. Mm Mm-hmm. I know it's just it's incredible when I think about it. It's overwhelming when I, you know, you don't. There's not a whole, whole lot of times that you stop and really mm-hmm. think about. People used to tell me about you know God's God's stories, right? <laughs> like where they were, they felt God's presence, or they saw God, mm-hmm. or they heard God. And I used to always think that they're making that up. That's why. That's one of the main reasons that I want to tell my testimony to the world is because it happens. People can be transformed 
Amen. G- God can change your life completely. We it doesn't have a matter. For that. We call it the two by four upside the head. Yes, we do. And what was your <laughs> defining moment? Your two by four upside the head. <laughs> That's I funny. Arizona jail. Arizona, Arizona jail. jail. Yeah. Right. And I thought I was thinking, why did you name him Ezra? Ezra is um is actually it is biblical. It and, is. Um, That's what I'm saying. He yeah. led um, Ezra. I because I did study the Bible a lot while I was in jail. After that, because I you didn't have a lot of time, on, time, on, time on my hands to <laughs> yeah. do some do whatever reading I wanted to. So Ezra led a revival. Uh, you know, one of the revivals in the in the Bible, and mm-hmm. um, his name means help. Wow. That's the me- mm-hmm. the meaning of of the the name Ezra means help and strength. And the, um, you know, Ezra in the Bible was um, just a real, he's described as just a real deva- devoted, God loving priest. And, you know, he was out there. And what's amazing about my son is he loves God. He, in fact, it was his idea. And I, this was his idea. He wanted to, to start. Um, we have a, a, a side thing that really was his idea about creation response. He's like, I want to have a creation response team where we go out and we t- knock on people's doors and tell people about Jesus. Wow. And so we wow. do do that. And we have – there's some kids from his school that come with us. Really? Yes. Wow. And you just go knocking door to door. Yes. And he talks. He'll say, are you a Christian? I mean, he he will talk to anyone about God. That's one of his wow. gifts, amazingly enough. Evangelist right there. Bold. Wow. Mm-hmm. Ezra Lessing, the evangelist. <laughs> right? What I know. a cool name. Yeah, really. I know. So. You either got to be a drummer or an evangelist with that name. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. A drummer. He does like the drums. Does he? I try to get him into um, pian- piano, and he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Oh. No. Well, you got the keyboard. The mm-hmm. guitarist, mm-hmm. yeah, and drummer. Yeah, the drummer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's what you are. Fritz. I know. Yes. Thank you. Mm-hmm. It's just um, the creative portion of that, though. I wish I had taken up another instrument where I could be, you know, I have such a passion for music like you do, and I, it's hard to really be creative on the drums, you know, like, hey, come listen to this new song I wrote. <laughs> on the drums, right? <laughs> uh, but you know, oh, that's I thought, beautiful. when I saw you doing the drums, I thought, you know, it must be cool to do the drums because you're the one that is like leading the band it's true like you're it is cool to worship i mean because the drummer is key the, the probably the most key player in the band yeah and uh that's just because everybody's keeping yeah. pace with you mm-hmm. so if you're off everybody's and off. the fe- <laughs> and also the feeling and the and passion from a song can come from the beats of yep. the drum. Absolutely. I mean that that rhythm. That's, that's what. True. And people don't recognize that when they're listening to a song. You don't think about that because you know you're listening to the words and you hear the piano and the guitar because those are more obvious, mm-hmm. right? But the passion comes from the drums. And you guys are building me up tonight. It's not about <laughs> me tonight. It's not about me. It's about that's you, right. Liz. <laughs> okay. But, uh, I needed that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. That was very encouraging. Good. Thank you, Liz. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Liz, for sharing. Yeah. You're welcome. It was yeah. great. Thanks for having me. No problem. And we did uh, plug the business. That's uh, we did Venom Venom Pest Control. Yep. Do we have a phone number? Yep. Website. Yeah. Website is um, venompest.net. Check it out. And phone number is three five two nine seven eight one five five seven. Okay. Venom Pest. Check it out. Well, that's it for session 28. That's right. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. You've listened to God Stories Radio, session 28. I'm Fritz. I'm Mike. And I'm Trish. God bless. God bless. God bless.